What is up? Welcome back to the Two Tall Sports Podcast. Got a great guest today, another fellow podcaster and former baseball player. His name is Keith Ramsey. He is the head coach at Miracosta High School for the baseball program. And his podcast is called Heading for Home Podcast. So please go check that out, subscribe, and uh, check out his episodes as well. We both have very similar backgrounds that I found out during the episode. And uh, we're working with the same media group. So we got a lot of good stuff coming for you. Great episode with Keith today. Um, please check us out at Two Tall Sports Podcast. You can find me on Instagram, on Twitter. It's going to be at Two Tall Sports. You can find me there. And also on YouTube, please subscribe and leave a comment. Hit the bell notification if you want to get notified every time there's an episode. We normally drop them on Thursday mornings. Uh, so please go check out the YouTube channel if you want to watch the interviews. If you want to listen on the audio side, it's going to be on Apple Podcasts. Just type in Two Tall Sports Podcast. Please subscribe and also scroll all the way down. Hit the five stars uh, so we can get some more notoriety, more exposure for the show. That'd be awesome. If you are so kind, please drop a comment down there. Leave a review. That'll also help boost the show as well. So Two Tall Sports Podcast on Apple Podcasts. We're also on Spotify. We're on Amazon Music. We're on Pandora, Google Play. Wherever you get your podcasts, we're there. So please check us out wherever you can. Drop us a line. And uh, if you'd like to email the show, it's Two Tall Sports Podcast at gmail.com. Once again, my episode is with former uh, professional baseball player Keith Ramsey. And uh, please enjoy. I'll see you on the other side. Two Tall Sports All right, welcome back to the Two Tall Sports Podcast. My next guest is a former professional baseball player. He played parts of 11 seasons, including minor league baseball, independent ball, professionally in Taiwan and Italy. He's currently the head coach of Miracosta High School's baseball program, and he's also the host of the Heading for Home podcast. He is Keith Ramsey. What's up, Keith? Thanks for being on the show. Hey, man. Thanks. Appreciate it, Brad. How are you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm good, man. Cruising. It's a, uh, you know, it's beautiful day in sunny Southern California. I know, like, it's kind of odd weather right now, but um, yeah, no, all good. Yeah. Can't get any better than that. Yeah. So, yeah, just for reference, Keith and I met through some mutual uh, media contacts. We're both kind of working with the same, with uh, alongside the same company, Diamante Media. So um, yeah. it was finally good to get get each other on the on the shows here so i'm happy to get you on finally <laughs> yeah thanks man. i appreciate it. yeah no it's been it's been good so far a uh, ton of learning right with with the whole podcast thing and like how it works and you know so far so far it's been really fun yeah definitely we'll get to that we'll get to your podcast a little later but i do want to get to you kind of your background um it's i found some I, I looked up of course your wikipedia page so you had a nice you had a lengthy wikipedia page is awesome I, um, I don't know who wrote it, but God bless them, whoever the, did. There's some good some good nuggets on there, and one of them I found out, which is crazy. Um, your uncle John Ramsey used to be the yeah. public address announcer for the Dodgers from 1958 to 1982. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty, pretty awesome. awesome. Um, the the best part of that was so I felt it a little bit, but my dad really felt it, and so it was uh, it was my great uncle, it was my dad's uncle, okay. and so. He did the Dodgers, Raiders, Rams, Trojans, and I think that might have been it. Maybe Lakers as well. And so what would happen was any big sporting event, my parent, my dad, my uncle, my grandfather, they all got hooked up. I mean, they went to the Super Bowl in 81 or whatever that was when the Rams were in it, in the Rose Bowl, um, you know, big, big finals events type things. They were there. And this was, you know, a much different generation where, you know, there was, I think there's a lot more access. So. I mean, they got to see so many cool things. And then the irony of that is my grandfather was also the team pharmacist, the Dodgers. Oh, wow. So, you know, my dad would be at home 15 years old and he gets a knock on the door and it's Willie Davis or, or Manny Motor or something needing their, you know, their, their prescription. It's just kind of, kind of wild. So, so baseball was kind of always in the blood. It was yeah. kind of inevitable in a sense. Definitely. Is it, is it kind of like in the blood also that you're, you know, doing podcasting now, a form of like announcing or broadcasting? It is. And, and um, yeah. And so a few years ago, I actually got into uh, some color anal some analysis, some broadcasting, um, the play, not the play by play, but more of just the, you know, analysis side. And 
it was we did a city final baseball game at Dodger Stadium and I actually got to sit in Ben Scully's deal which was the box next to where my great uncle was oh, and so wow. that was pretty awesome I mean you know the the game was on local tv local like public access tv so there weren't a lot of people watching but you know from a just memory standpoint it was pretty cool and cool. You know, I got a chance to take a picture in the in the seat that he used to sit in so you know definitely a pretty awesome thing yeah definitely um, you had a very impressive high school career and I just, before we get to, and we'll, I want to talk about the soccer stuff in a second, but, um, <laughs> as, that, I, uh, that was really cool to, to find out, but as far as your baseball career, so you went to Loyola high school in LA, your senior year, I saw you hit over 500. You were all league, all conference, all everything. Um, did you think your future in baseball was on the hitting side versus the pitching side? Um, that's a good question. So you know, you get told your whole life that you're a left-handed pitcher. So you have this inherent advantage. So I think I always deep down knew it was there. I think I was maybe a little bit better of a soccer player, not in the sense that, um, you know, obviously I had more potential in baseball, just be, again, being left-handed and on the mound, but soccer at that time, I, I really struggled my early part of the baseball career. Um, it was a deal where I got cut as a freshman, barely made JV as a sophomore, started out on JV as a junior. And so when senior year comes around, you know, that's in the spring. So in the, in the winter time, we're winning state championship in soccer the whole time. I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe this soccer thing is, has a bit of a higher, higher potential, but obviously it ended up not being the case, but at the time it was, it was very much up in the air. It was like, do I stick with this baseball thing and, or soccer? And, and then when baseball started and had a little bit of success, then it was a no brainer. Cause I always, and you know, baseball was always the first love. Right. As far, but I mean, did you think your future was a pitcher though? Not even though you hit 500. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You I thought was, so. Okay. A little, bit, a little bit of a Judy. Like I could run into a couple, but there was, okay. there was more line drives over the shortstops had that type deal. Got it. And when okay. you, and when you'd see somebody that was really a hitting prospect, it was pretty obvious that maybe we weren't, we weren't the same. And, and again, like I could hit, I could play defense, I could throw from the outfield. Um, but there just wasn't that power tool that, you know, the great ones really had, and it was pretty right. obvious when they would step up. So, so I think maybe deep down, yeah, I didn't have a great year on the mound, but I think, you know, always was able to spin a curveball. um, you know, soft lefty, but, you know, had some moments of a little more velocity, but yeah, uh, it's, I, th I think at the end of the day, yeah, I think I, I knew I was probably going to be a pitcher. Okay. Gotcha. So yeah, let's talk about your soccer stuff for a second. You were a CIF goalie of the year, like a state champion soccer team. Like you mentioned, that's pretty incredible that, how, what was the determining factor that soccer, like, were you getting offers? Like what was going to be your, So no, I wasn't. Cause I didn't play club soccer. So that was a big part of it. You know, that the things we're seeing now with club baseball, had already started well be before in soccer. So, um, club, the soccer thing I really enjoyed. And I think what really made it for me was we had a team that was incredibly close and, you know, fought for each other and battled and ended up winning, you know, winning that championship. And so, it, from a team wise, it was one of the, the best memories of my life. Um, and I think maybe my accolades were very much a result of being on a really good team. Um, I was still pretty green on the soccer side, even though I was having success, but, uh, but no, it was, it was awesome. Um, there was definitely when it's going on and you're, and you're getting shut out. So you definitely have thoughts of like, should I keep doing this? But then again, like I said, when, when spring rolled around, I started playing baseball again, had a little bit of success. It was I'm probably going to stick with that. So. Gotcha. Okay. So I saw you end up going to LA Harbor uh, City College or junior college. Um, what were those first couple of years like? Did you think like this is, it, you know, JC ball is about as far as I'm going to get, or did you have, did you think I can play at a division one level? At, after um, that? That's, that's a great, great question. Just because I think it's a little of both. Um, finishing out at Loyal high school, I had an opportunity to walk on at LMU and literally in June, I get a call like, and we go into a meeting with the coach at the time. And he says, you know, um, we like you, but we can't guarantee you're going to be on the team. And at that point, if I was, if he said you're on the team, I was going to LMU. I had a little bit of a tiny academic scholarship. Um, that was where I was going. And when, as soon as we heard that, and then, you know, he, he made a comment, something like, you know, you, know, you, you probably make it, but probably 50, 50. And I'm like, wow. Okay. So 50% chance that my career could be over. All the while, I had a coach at Loyal High School that was moving on to Harbor College that's named Andy Diver that said, hey, you know, come with me and you'll be able to go and play after. I can't promise you where, but I think you'll be able to do a good job and you'll be able to play after. And so 
I ended up going on with that and literally the smartest decision I ever made in my life. I'm just coach Diver was there. He was fantastic. Coach Ullman, who's now at Tulane um, as an assistant coach there, fantastic. And again, it just allowed a different level of grit that kind of you were able to, to find that you really had that maybe you didn't realize you had. And so that's why it was such a great decision. So I think to answer your question, I thought it was possible. I felt like I was, you know, maybe a D1 walk-on type at the time, not a scholarship guy, but walk-on type. Um, and so I, I knew it was out there by the same token. When you start getting recruiting calls from bigger schools, you know, that are actually interested in like offering you and bringing yeah. you on a trip, it's, it's kind of like, whoa, this is, it's almost like imposter syndrome. Like, sure you're calling me? Like, is this the right guy? <laughs> we got yeah. some other guys that are pretty good too. So, right. So I think, yeah, a little both. I mean, I, it was pretty awesome though. I have to say, this is off script, but I the fact that you just mentioned Andy Diver, so you and I are connected more than you think. Oh, I, really? I went to University of Arizona for two years, oh, and wow. I had Diver as the pitching coach at the time and Andy Lopez after he left Florida. Okay, yeah. not all great for me, though. I It wasn't a great experience for me with yeah, them. I, 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 wasn't, I was kind sorry. of a recruited walk-on there. Um, Diver was... I don't know. He just, we, we didn't click like it just, whatever. Yeah, got it. Yeah. You know, Lopez isn't every, he's not for everybody. No, I know. Um, I know. <laughs> that's it's, crazy it's, though, that you had him at Florida and you guys, did, were you there for the championships or? No, I was there after. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. He was, okay. Uh, 98 was the year they went to, and I got there in 2000. So got it. Right. I, ju okay. I just missed that. And we were in very much in the transition of him leaving and then coach McMahon who came in after him. Okay. Um, but we, we had a decent year. I don't know why they got rid of him, but. Yeah, that was what that's crazy, though. So, yeah, I had both of those. I know that's that's different. small world, right? That's what I'm telling you, like the baseball thing, you run into more people where you're like, boy, you know, this guy, how do you know this guy? And it could be something on the other side of the country. It's just it's kind of amazing. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and Lopez, obviously, he's won wherever he's been. He's he knows his yeah. stuff baseball wise. I think he's just not for not everybody's cup of tea, I think. <laughs> so, you know, as you know, yeah, it's just, you know, especially if you're not on scholarship, like. Yeah, you're just no, not one of the I guys. Know, like, yeah, exactly. You have to outperform. You, had, you had Coach Waz too, didn't you? Yeah, Waz. That's yeah. right, Waz yeah. Kelsey. That's right. The whole During crew. Oregon. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Okay, so let's get to Florida. Um, when you did, how did how did that all come about? You going from LA Harbor all the way to University of Florida? How did that all come together? So Lopez went to Harbor. Okay, um, gotcha. played, played at Harbor and then coached at Harbor before moving on um, to to Mira Costa where actually I currently coach, which is another small world type wow. thing. And, uh, and then, you know, then he went to Dominguez and then obviously to Florida. So he, right. he had the Southern California connection. He's from San Pedro, uh, Harbor college is in Wilmington, which is the next kind of town over. And so yeah. there's that connection. And he, he had success with a guy named Derek Nicholson. Okay. Um, D Nick, as many people know him guy had a great career, both in college and in the, in the minor leagues, uh, big league level hitter, maybe, defensively couldn't find a position but but so he had a great career at florida so lopez has some success with that and then he says okay i'm going to try to find the next one and you know whether we, there are a couple of guys whether we were or we weren't but that was a huge help for us gotcha okay and then you um you know you were pretty much committed to being a reliever it looked like in your first year your junior year at uh, florida did well and you end up getting drafted by cincinnati in the 11th round of the 2001 draft um, you chose to come back to school, though. I know it's, a, it's usually a tough call for guys. What, what went into that decision to come back? So um, it's funny. Like, when you think about it now, I think I would have signed for, like, 70 grand. Okay. And they offered me 50. And we were under the impression that it was a negotiation. And they were not. Right. And uh, so there is the, – the guy I, who I picked to – represent me i'm not sure if he had a great relationship with the organization or not okay. and so they ended up pulling the offer the scout come back comes back later and says you know we could probably get this done you know what's it going to take and then like a day later from my recollection i think they said hold on we gotta save money for jeremy sowers who was our first round pick okay and so i was kind of hanging by the wayside and then eventually it was just like hey we don't have the money for you right you know, your your offer was 50 you passed you know, we're going to move on. So, wow. I mean, one of those things that, like I said, it, you know, $15,000 or $20,000, yeah. small number, yeah. but obviously everything kind of happened for a reason in that end. Yeah, definitely. And you come back, you became a starter. I saw, and uh, you did really well. You had two complete games. 
you get drafted one round earlier in the 10th round and you sign with the Cleveland Indians. So what do you remember about that senior year that getting ready and then the draft process that year? So um, I remember having very high expectations for where I was getting drafted. And I don't know if that was good or bad. I think it was probably a negative because you start throwing to the radar gun. You start right. throwing to, um, to your, to your potential prospects versus I'm trying to win a ball game for my team. And I think the first two or three weeks I had a good start, a decent start, and then a horrendous start. And I want to say the one after that was just okay. And there was kind of a little bit of a come to Jesus moment where it was like, all right, look, like this isn't going to work. I'm, I'm a much better pitcher than I'm throwing right now. So I have to find what, what inspires me. And, and so it was a, it was one of those, all right, let's, let's go. I have to, I'm, I gotta be a team guy now. I can't be thinking about my draft stuff. Right. And, um, and we had a great group that year. We won 40 something games, a wow. bunch of guys drafted uh, future big leaguers on the roster. And so I think when that switch flipped, that was a, a very positive thing. And I think if I would have, continue to throw the way I was throwing, trying to light up radar guns. I might've been drafted a little higher, but the experience that we had that year as a group collectively, you know, competing, that was, that was special. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful it went the way it was, the way it did because couldn't have, couldn't have asked for a better um, organization than the Indians and couldn't have asked for a better experience with that group. Right. Okay. And I mean, as a senior, it's hard because you don't have as much leverage. So you almost yeah, like, you have zero. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, so you kind of got to take what they give you. Um, yeah, Ten real grand, quick, any that's what it was. Yeah, Ten grand. right. <laughs> a plane ticket. That's all you get. Yeah. Um, do you have any Andy Lopez stories? Are any any memories from that I, from him? Oh yeah, yeah I, I have a ton. I mean, I, <laughs> I think with 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 Lopez, my one of my favorites was. You know, he was very, he was a great motivator, obviously, um, yeah. you know, super successful. And he found ways to kind of keep everybody in check. And we had a guy that was six and oh, the year before as a junior, senior year, this is my junior year, senior year. He's not throwing as well. Great guy named Eddie Rojas. One of my, one of my favorites, as funny as can be. So anyway, he's not throwing well about a third of the way through the season and he's in the training room and he's telling the trainers that, and the cross country coach and players that the Braves are looking at him. And so, you know, that's guys trying to, you know, impress some girls. Sure. And sure. Pretty, pretty standard stuff, but somehow Lopez hears about it. Okay. So we're out in the outfield and Lopez is, he, he has another poor outing. I think the night before he's got us all gathered up. He's, and he's, he's going on. He's like, you know, we're, the level we're at isn't enough. You know, I'm, I'm disappointed with, with where our mental edge is. And, and, but, 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 but we have good news, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, we have good news. And you can picture this because you played for Lopes. Oh. He almost turns into like a pre, you know, preacher on Sundays. He goes, yes. but we have good news. I hear the Braves are looking at one of our pitchers. The Atlanta Braves are looking at one of our pitchers. It's going to be Maddox, Glavin, Smoltz, Millwood, and Rojas. <laughs> Got it, guys? It's going to be Glavin, Maddox, Smoltz, Millwood, Rojas. And he kept repeating it. And, dude, like, we couldn't contain ourselves. Like, you, you could, whether you wanted to be serious or not, we had no chance. Like, the, the whole team's cracking up. Obviously, Eddie is – just mortified. But oh, I'm sure it was, it was, uh, that's one of my funnier ones. Oh, he was notorious for the long talks in the outfield after games. Practice was his time, right? He would just, yeah. and he'd pick a yeah. guy each day and yep. rip them to shreds for the whole practice. Yep. And I'm just like, what is this dude? Like, <laughs> obviously he knew his stuff. Great. You know, he knows baseball. Yeah. He's great, great yeah. coach, but he was like a Bobby Knight kind of like out of that he, mold. You know? He knew how to push buttons. Yeah. yeah. You know, I remember the other, another one was, so one of the first fall Saturday practice we had, it was always, was it Saturday? Yes, it was always the weekend of a big football game. So, you know, the, the night before Friday night, most of the team's going out to the bars, drinking too much. So we have 7 a.m. practice on a Saturday before a football game. So okay. the whole team can go and take recruiting trips and all that stuff. So we, he pulls us in the locker room and he proceeds to tell us legitimately an hour and a half story about the Osprey how they lay their eggs up in the lights <laughs> and just goes this 
long drawn out story. And obviously he's trying to find out who can maintain their attention and focus and who can't. But as a 20 year old or 21 year old, you are just like, yeah, guys falling asleep, guys that are hung over. I mean, it's, is all time. Wow. Yeah. He, <laughs> we don't have to keep going on him. <laughs> um, so anyway, as far as your early pro ball career. Okay. So how was the transition for you from college to the first couple of years in pro ball? It was actually good. And I think a lot of it had to do with, I had really good teammates. Um, I had a great, great group around of coaches that like we actually trusted and liked, and we felt like we we're competing for championships. And it, it that transition was kind of easy. Um, I think the Indians do a really good job of player development in general. They do a really good job of balancing, like it's important to win while also developing as well. So we were super successful the first few years. I mean, we won multiple, multiple championships. We were in the finals um, in 03 in my second year and lost to a Rome, Georgia team that had Jeff Francoeur and Brian McCann and oh, yeah. a bunch of other big league arms guys that had cups of coffee. So it was, it was a really talented talented group so that that made it fun that didn't for me the um the adjustment wasn't very big because it actually felt a little bit more like college in a lot of ways because we were still trying to win i know that's not the case with every other organization yeah um so and and i really noticed that when i went to the rockies and not that they weren't trying to win it just had a different vibe to it and look i didn't pitch well so that didn't help um and i was coming off a couple of good years with the indians so but but the transition in was was felt relatively pretty comfortable. Okay. Yeah, you had a, a great start to your career. And a huge moment for you I saw was um, in high A, Carolina League. You're, the last game of the season, you throw a yeah. perfect game, pretty crazy. What 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 kind of what do you remember about that, uh, that game? So I actually remember a lot. Um, I remember the night before, you know, it's the last game of the year. We know we're going to the playoffs. We were really scuffling, though. And I remember we're all sitting around. I want to say we thought we were going to get rained out. And we're sitting around like this sushi, sushi type restaurant. And, and guys are actually like having nice meals, which is pretty rare. And especially in minor league baseball. Sure, and I yeah. remember this long discussion got brought up about, Hey guys, we got a chance to win it this year. Um, you know, let's be ready to roll tomorrow. We have to find some form of energy moving into the playoffs. Cause we hadn't had it. We'd lost maybe seven of eight or, you know, whatever it was, we weren't in a good spot. We had guys taken up to double a, um, you know, and so, there was, you know, going to the ballpark that day, it was a feeling of like, okay, let's finish strong. Let's, this isn't just the last game of the year for, for me, at least. And whether those guys remembered it or not, I didn't know. Uh, get to the bullpen, can't throw a strike, like legitimately cannot throw a strike. They have the catcher move up on the plate. And I'm sure you've had this at some point in your career when you just, just can't find it. it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So they're like, hey, move them up. So literally the catcher is squatted on home plate and I'm throwing my, my warm up, you know, in that left field bullpen. And I'm starting to like maybe feel it a little bit. So first inning rolls out, little drizzle, you know, go one, two, three, pretty uneventful in the first inning, you know, ground out, strike out, pop up or something. And uh, game starts to move along. And I had this routine where I would drink two cups of water and I'd stack them right next to me throughout the game. And I would go through the, the next three hitters. And about fourth or fifth inning, I started to realize that I was, it was the same, like, you know, it was one, two, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm like, wow, okay, this is, I don't think anybody's gotten on. And so it's starting to rain a little harder now. And that, you know, I find out later that the umpires had real talks about banging the game about just shutting it down after five, let's get five in and call it. Yeah. And because of what was going on, thankfully for my sake, they let, they it, let it continue. Um, so anyway, we get to get to the eighth inning. There's a guy named Jonathan Sherholz who was hitting eight. I'm sorry, hitting, hitting, uh, what do we got? What do we got? We got sixth, two outs, nobody on, hitting sixth. I go 3 0 on him. Like, you know, 3 0 in the eighth inning of a perfect game, like, not ideal. Like, and especially a guy that really wasn't swinging it that well. Right. So I literally took a step off the back of the mound, took a deep breath, and said, I'm going to throw a four seamer right down the middle and see how far he can hit it. Well, he took it, thankfully. Did the same thing. Three one pitch. I'm gonna throw a four seamer right down the middle. And I didn't throw hard. Threw 85 or 80, you know, it was like 82 to 86 that day. Four seamer right down the middle, takes a huge hack, pops it straight up in the end. <laughs> Next inning, we we come out, uh, first quick out, second hitter, and you know, eight eight hitter, they pinch hit. Um, Brian McCann comes up 
who a guy I'd had a lot of success against just because lefty left lefty. Yeah. And uh, they actually, I'm sorry, they led him off. Then a guy named Ardley Jansen, who's Kenley's maybe brother or cousin. Okay. Smokes the ball in the right center gap. Um, 1 0 pitch. And our guy makes a circus catch in, in right center. Like, you know, flying Jonathan Van Every, like feet flying over his back, circus catch. Next guy grounds out. And I remember two things. I remember a guy named Nathan Pants- Panther, who was not playing that day, really good center fielder, but was down because he was battling some hamstring stuff. I, I see the ball go across, catch, turn around home plate to hug my catcher, and Panther's face is like right here about to tackle me. And I just got mobbed and Gatorade drenched, and my sister came up from University of Florida because she was going to school there. And uh, pretty awesome memory. I mean, it's, you know, you just – uh, maybe you can relate, maybe you can't in the sense that you look back at your career and there's like, didn't make a ton of money, didn't play in the big leagues, but there are like four or five things you're like legitimately proud of. And that's one of them. So it's cool. Uh, yeah, man. That's, I mean, in pro ball to throw a perfect game, that's uh and you know what else? They usually don't let guys get to a, a high pitch count no, either. I know. So yeah. that's hard to do. 97 yeah. pitches, man, and they had somebody warm it up. And I, if they would have taken me out, I might have fought, fought the guy. And it was Corey Lovello, <laughs> who's a great manager. Oh, like, yeah, Diamondbacks. Good, yeah, 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 good friend of mine, um, guy I have all the respect in the world for. I don't think he was going to let it happen, but I think he, just in case it went sideways. Well, so, those minor league managers get in trouble if you leave guys out yeah, there too long. Yeah. It's all and about development. Legit, I think it was hard count at 100. So Right, okay. I, I bet you. you if somebody would have got on, they would have taken me out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Real quick before we move on, I want to ask you about uh, going to Florida football games in general, just the SEC and all that stuff. What can you tell us about what it was like? I mean, you're from a Southern California guy. We don't have that kind of tradition. Down no, here. it's it's way different, right? And yeah. so I go to uh, – my recruiting trip is Florida, Tennessee. And obviously okay. – Lopez was smart and knew what he was doing. And I hadn't experienced anything like that. So, and Alex Brown is the D end and he probably sacked T Martin five times. It felt like, and you know, that just the roar of the crowd and kind of the pomp and circumstances of, you know, the, the tailgate and the pregame, I knew this is what I wanted to do. And yeah. was, from a baseball standpoint, I already knew they had a ton of fans that they were going to be a good club. And, you know, the opportunities in the SEC, it was, it was special. So, yeah, it was kind of a no-brainer no after I went to the football game. And, and they were all like that. I mean, my, my two years there, it was Rex Grossman was the quarterback. You know, they were a game away from going to the national championship uh, my, my senior year. So, special time for sure. Yeah, that sounds – that's pretty cool, man. Um, so, anyway, fast forward back to the end of 2004, you get to go to the Arizona Fall League, which is a big deal where all the up-and-coming prospects are. I did see that it was kind of a turning point in your career. So, what do you remember about – like, what changed for you mentally and physically when you got to the Fall League? So, I was gassed in the Fall League. And, you know, for better or for worse, it just was what it was. You know, I'd thrown almost 200 innings that year and, you know, making starts and jumping up from AAA down to high A and – um, cycling back up a couple times. So it felt like the, the biggest thing I think I would say is there are times in my career where I tried to reinvent myself thinking that what I was doing wasn't enough, you know, 82, 86, 80, and this was a different era guys. And not every through 96 back then, like there was a place for the lefty that threw 85 to 88. And I was maybe a shade below that. So I think what happened was I went down, saw a pitching coach, right before the fall league was trying to gain a little more velocity, tried to take that into the fall league while also working on a changeup, which was never a pit, good pitch of mine. I was always a curveball guy. And, you know, I kind of fell out of love with what I was good at. And when I look back, that's something I would, I mean, you know, whoever says they don't have regrets, God bless them. I have a bunch of regrets. I mean, I would have loved to just tell myself, Hey dude, you're fine. You just threw a perfect game. Like you just had a very good year and, had success in AAA and your team won the championship. Just go, just go be you. And yeah, I didn't do that. I, I tried to make some adjustments to gain more power, started leaving balls up in the fall league. Everybody's really good. I mean, Ryan Howard was there. Um, Petroya, like, I mean, it was a loaded year. And, yeah. and so that's what you're facing. So if you make mistakes against, you know, that caliber of player, they're going to make you pay. So, yeah. Well, so I, mean, no, I, I would say that was the biggest thing. Just, you know, a little bit of fatigue along with trying to, trying to maybe be somebody who I wasn't. Sure. And you still get draft. I saw you got uh, selected in the Rule Five draft by the Rockies right after that, yeah. which is pretty awesome. So, I mean, you had. Did you still think, even though maybe you didn't get your best stuff out in the fall league, did you still think, all right, 
this is a big jump for me. I actually also got roll five. So we, we got a lot in okay. common, man. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Seriously. Um, did you think that was like your, your turn, your breaking point or like, yeah, I guess absolutely. your big break? I did. Yeah, I did because the Indians were loaded at the time, uh, loaded yeah. with young talent, loaded with young big league talent. You know, the guys in front of me were Cliff Lee and Billy Traber and Francisco or uh, Fausto Carmona. And, you know, these were like big leaguers, the guys that had been up there a long time. So, and they're all young. So it was, yeah. you go to the Rockies and you're thinking, okay, this is my shot. And again, trying to be something I wasn't, there were some adjustments made. Um, you know, maybe some coaches wanted to put their stamp on some things, but, but ultimately it boils down to, you know, as players, it's good to listen to your coaches. There are times though, when you got to trust your gut and trust like kind of what your talents really are. And that's, that's something that, like the regret part when you look back at your career where it's like, man, if I would have just stuck with it, maybe I don't make it, maybe, you know, it doesn't happen, but at least I can say, yeah, I went all in on, on myself versus what maybe somebody else thought I could be. It's hard to not listen to the coaches sometimes because as I'm sure you've heard this phrase a lot, it, they say it's your career, right? It's your yeah. career. <laughs> so it, but it's hard to be like, you know what? No, this, if the organization has a, a way of throwing or a, a certain, you know, mechanical change, yeah. how do you try to turn that down and say, no, I'm good how I am. And now no. you're difficult and stubborn and you're not coachable, but you yeah. know, your body more than anyone else does. So, yeah. Well, and that was one of the things. So we were uh, in the fall league, they, they didn't want me to throw the split finger. They wanted me to throw my change up to work on it. And I, till I was 29, 30 years old, I didn't have a change up. Okay. Um, I just, you know, was the, the lefty anomaly that couldn't figure it out. So right. get to the Rockies and they say, well, prospects don't throw split fingers. It's like, okay. What does that even mean? So I'll try, I'll try, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. But again, like a, a more, uh, more confident person would have said, Hey, fine i'm still throwing one and you guys do what you want but i think that was you, know, you kind of become too coachable sometimes you're like okay well this guy obviously knows who he's talking about he's a double right. a pitching coach triple a pitching coach whoever he is then i'll do that and so yeah i don't like when organizations try to mold people all, to all be the same or there's I a know. big leaguer and like all the lefties for instance you need to throw like that guy it's like yeah, no exactly. we can't do what he does and he doesn't do what we do you know what i mean it's, exactly Exactly. Yeah, no, I hundred percent agree, man. It's, you know, it's interesting. The game's changed a lot in a good way, in my opinion. I just think it's a lot more, you know, meritoc, a lot more meritocracy these days, a lot more, you know, just actually trying to, to get better with some data to back it up versus, you know, it just hasn't done, isn't done that way. And right. you got to follow whatever they say. So, right. Yeah, it's true. I want to ask you about playing independent ball. So after you are done playing affiliated ball over the next few years, you end up playing in Somerset, uh, which is in the Atlantic league and Southern Maryland. Also, I played for long Island. So I know both of those. Oh, teams. Nice. Yeah. yeah there you go. So I got Somerset was like the big rival, you know, when we yeah, were in Long absolutely. Island. So um, what do you like? Very similar environments. Yes, Somerset, exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, did that kind of bring back the joy for you? Cause a lot of people say um, they'll never play independent ball until they have to. So yeah. what did independent ball do for you? So I think the biggest thing that it got me back to like thinking of baseball as a game, so to speak, and competing. And I'd say the first year or so I was really caught up in trying to get back and got an opportunity after the first year. Um, but after that, yeah, you just, it almost turns back into Legion ball in a sense that like you're trying to win again. You're not, you hit a point where you pr realize you're probably not getting picked up. So then it yeah. becomes about having fun and competing and, you know, what the game is truly built on. And so, yeah, no, I would say there's definitely a level of, of love. And I, I, the other thing too, I think it was a bigger level or a big time of growth for me just as a pitcher and kind of understanding what I did well. And, and I put time into it. And there was a great book I read called uh, Thinking Body, Dancing Mind that really kind of resonated with me as far as how an athlete should flow throughout their delivery and, and think about things. And, you know, that was, I think my first foray into like, what coaching could be like. And, and so doing that, and I feel like just, again, big, big time of growth, met some of my favorite people in baseball at that time. And, and it was, it was nothing but generally positives. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I ended up like, right when you start, you think, all right, I'm only going here to get picked up. I don't want to play an independent ball. Like I'm not going like winning is cool, but like, that's not why I'm going to play an independent ball. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm going to get back yeah. to affiliated ball. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. And so you were in long Island. What years? Just 2014. Okay. So we yeah. just missed each other. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, it was a great experience. It, it was a lot of fun. And there's a lot more talent in the league than people give it credit for. That's for sure. There's ex-big leaguers I, all throughout the league. 
Yeah. I mean, yeah. X. So there was, and granted they weren't in their prime, but when I get to Somerset, the Long Island Ducks have Carl Everett, Juan Gonzalez, Henry Rodriguez, and Edgardo Alfonso. <laughs> and while they maybe didn't have quite the bat speed, the men, the knowledge of the game was sick. And yeah. you made a mistake against those guys. They made you pay because mentally they were so dialed into what you were trying to do against them. Right. And it was, it was really cool to watch. And it was, I, I used to love watching a guard Alfonso hit because it was just so balanced and there wasn't anything I could throw that got him off of his game. Now he might've mishit it, but from a, just an understanding of, you know, a, a task and, and, you know, he was just amazing. The big league guys are so hard to get out once you start facing them. Like they, they rarely, like they know the plate so well. So it's yeah, yeah, crazy. exactly. Yeah. Play discipline, yeah. understanding where he wanted to get a ball. Like he's just, it was good. And yeah. the other thing too, I, I remember a couple of times, you know, you throw a pitch they're not expecting with two strikes, tip your cap and move on. It wasn't this wild swing. Like you fooled me. It was more like, all right, you got me this time. Yeah. I'm going to get you next time. It was right. just, it was a little different. It was cool though. Yeah. For sure. Um, I want to ask you, so you got to end up playing in Taiwan, which is, is pretty cool. It's a different world. I know you have a, a great story on that. Or we'll, we'll, we'll Touché, I guess, yeah. whatever story. Uh, <laughs> um, how was your experience in Taiwan? So the experience in Taiwan was generally good. Um, I enjoyed being in Taipei. I thought it was, it was different. It was, you know, had some similarities to New York. Uh, the, the thing I didn't necessarily love, the, I thought it was a little smoggy, you know, had that a little bit vibe, but you know, I actually enjoyed my time in Taipei. I enjoyed um, being in that environment and with that team. My biggest problem was I was in an area of my career where I wasn't throwing very hard. And when you start not throwing very hard in professional baseball and you start to know it, you know, it just you start to mess, gets me mess with your head a little bit mentally. So I go over there and um, I got like a three week acclimation period, throw a couple bullpens. First one, like they're giving me like the, what is this guy doing here thing? Like this guy's terrible. Uh, <laughs> next one's a little better. Finally about the third bullpen and, and, you know, personnel is starting to gather around after the second bullpen. Like, you know, this isn't, this is not good. And I, I was making a little bit of money at the time. So third bullpen, I realized like I better bring it today or I might be getting sent home before I even throw a pitch. And so that one was really good. They said, okay, you know, you can throw one more and then we'll make your start through one more, it was whatever, it was fine. So I make my start and I don't think I threw that bad. I really don't. Like I was like 84 to 87 in the game, which for me was actually pretty good. Okay. Um, Curveball was okay. And I, I'm giving up hits and I'm like, good Lord, like at least that's a pretty good swing for a, you know, a one Oh split, like, you know, give me a break. And so yeah. I get hit a little bit, um, get sent home pretty quickly at thereafter. And so a couple of years later, I'm, I'm somewhere and I, I see this like message go through on the internet of like gambling problems in Taiwan. And literally the catcher on our team is indicted for point shaving gambling. Because there's <laughs> definitely a mafia, dude, there's a mafia influence over there where Whoa. they're betting on games and trying to get guys to, to give up, you know, go, go out and throw a game pretty much, you know, do like the, the shoeless Joe eight men out thing yeah and it was it was crazy so <clears throat> needless to say man I'm, I'm thinking back to it later i'm like god that's why they were on that 1-0 split I mean, yeah that's why i got hit around <laughs> yeah yeah exactly the eight hitter how's he hitting that that's uh, it could have been i stunk but you know it's, it's one of the two your catcher had a price on his head man he was yeah, exactly yeah i know wow yeah. you never yeah, like that wild yeah like out here like that would not never, but it just doesn't happen, you know, like maybe no, point shaving in basketball or like Pete Rose, I guess, but yeah, you just don't see that. No, I know, man. It's wild. Yeah, that is crazy. Um, I wanted to ask you before we get to your coaching career, um, I saw you're a big music guy and you play guitar. Was there any consideration for you to, um, you know, go the music route and try to make something of yourself in that regard? Maybe in my mind, but if you heard me <laughs> sing, you'd realize that that wasn't happening. Um, you know, it's funny. We, I had a, I had a little band. We played at the Roxy, or I'm sorry, the Whiskey. Played at the Rainbow Room. Um, Where's that at? Played a little bit of, around Hollywood. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so yeah, so we're on the Hollywood Strip at that point. Famous gotcha. Whiskey a Go Go, the uh, the Rainbow Room. And so, you know, at the time you're doing it, you're like, oh, this is sweet. Yeah, I can maybe do this. Then you yeah. then you start to see how good others are, and you're like, ah, okay, I can play at the Rainbow Room on a Sunday night. I can't play 
a real show, but right. I did write songs. I did record songs, um, had a blast with a band that I played with. And so, no, it was, I mean, I love it. I still play. That's day, cool. But, Just like jam it, it, sessions or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my brother is a professional musician and he's, I mean, the, the difference in talent level between us two is pretty stark. So that was another reminder that, you know, you're fine, but you're not good. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it's kind of your side, like fun outlet. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. That's to this cool. day still. Nice. Okay. That's good. Um, how did you go from, all right, so your baseball career is winding down and then you decide to start coaching. So how do you go from, you were just a player and then you realized <laughs> I could be a coach at some point? Well, I think, uh, you know, we all kind of do what we wish we had for us. And I think, you know, when I, when I got done coaching or I got done playing, I, the opportunity to, to coach a club team, local club team called the Manhattan Beach Heaters. And um, a guy named Doug Livingston, who I knew a little bit just from living in the area, uh, reached out and said I could coach it. And so I was like, sure. It was, you know, we're not used to making any money as professional baseball players, like on the minor league side. Yeah. So, you know, they're offering like, you know, I want to say like 1500 bucks a month time. I'm like, whoa, really? For club baseball? Sweet. I'm in. And end up really kind of getting into the, the deal and, and the coaching side. And, and I think it really helped that I had a great group of kids and a great group of parents on that first, um, that first team. And so fast forward, when I get to Miracosta, a lot of those same kids were on that team. And so that was kind of, there's been this connection that has kind of gone the whole time. But I think, you know, for me, it was, it was one of those things where I felt like we all want a mentor or somebody to kind of help us navigate you know, turbulent waters. Yeah. And that was something I felt like I could provide for those kids. And the, what was the process of getting the Miracosta job from just for, you know, you're coaching travel ball. How did you get to get the head job at the high yeah. school? So, um, so I'm coaching travel ball. I end up getting a job at Mir, uh, sorry, Crossroads high school in Santa Monica, California. And the athletic director is a guy named Ira Smith, somebody who I, you know, have the, the utmost respect for still really good friends to this day. And he had seen me in action when we coached a little league all-star team together. He was the head coach. Um, he played a long time in the minor leagues, 12, 12, 13 years is the, one of the few, there's two, two time division one hitting batting leaders, batting champs. And that Iris Smith is one of them. So he's a, Damn. he's a baseball guy that had a great career. Yeah. So he taught me a lot on the coaching side and then he ends up getting an AD job at this high school and, and kind of brings me in and we, um, you know, I was there for one year. It was actually a terrific year. I loved it. I thought the kids were tremendous people. And um, there was an opportunity after the year to go to Miracosta. And, and the challenge was I loved my time at Crossroads. And with this, I had this longstanding relationship with several of these kids at Miracosta. And Miracosta was a, you know, a little bit of a higher end on the baseball side than Crossroads. And okay. so, you know, it was, it was, it was tough. It was one of these decisions you make to, to this day. I think if I would have stayed at Crossroads, I still also would have been happy, but uh, Miracosta has been good. And, and since then it's, you know, been a pretty uh, satisfying as far as like, you know, the challenges and things that brings up. Yeah, for sure. I wanted to ask you about coaching this generation of players. So obviously the kids are a lot different than when you grew up and I grew up, what's it been like, you know, being a head coach and dealing with, you know, 15 to 18 year olds. And how do you communicate um, with them versus maybe how you grew up in the game? Well, I think one of the biggest things I do is I, it, it works out. I don't normally talk for a very long time. I'm normally like two minutes and get them out of here. Um, practices are about two hours and we're done. Right. So I think trying to understand that how long I truly have their attention for, and it might not even be two minutes. Like I can, I see eyes glaze over after about 35 seconds. Okay. So there are times when I'm giving a speech, I start to see that and I immediately, I pull, pull the cord, like I'm, I'm going on to something else. So I think that's the biggest thing. It's just, there's a little bit of a different, um, attention level, you know, how much they can take. So I, I try to be cognizant of that. And then the other thing is they, they aren't afraid to compete. They like to compete. The thing is you just got to kind of bring them into what they should be kind of competing on or like how to do that. And my big thing is like, you know, understand that this thing you're doing, this thing you're a part of is special. Like being a part of something where you're trying to achieve something great, not everybody gets to do that. And the more we can kind of cherish that opportunity versus, 
I got to go to practice. This stinks. You know, just try to change their perspective a little bit or, or remind them how you know, lucky we are to be on a baseball field and competing together. And, um, and, and I've been lucky. I've had great kids and great families. I mean, that's, as, as they always say, you need the horses. Well, I've, I've had the horses. I've had great, great support, great, ad, great administration. I mean, it's, I've been lucky. Well, that's awesome. And, and speaking of having the horses, you had a kid last year, his name is Petey Halpin, went 95th overall in the draft and signed a big contract um, with, in pro ball. What was that like to coach? Uh, you know, not a lot of coaches get to, to have a high caliber player like that. So what was that like for you last year? Yeah, it was, it was fun. Um, the thing I liked about Petey is that I, I think Petey could play in any era of baseball that there was. He could play in the 30s. He could play in the 70s. He could play in the 90s. And he could play now. Um, he, he kind of lived, eat, breathe baseball, you know, that, that whole thing. And yeah. you know, he, so he'd show up to the park ready to go almost pretty much every day. And I think that's kind of rare for a teenager. He had his plan. He hit, um, he was super into it. It was, you could tell this, this is what he wanted to do and felt like he was born to do. And that, that is something that, you know, as much as we've had a lot of successful kids on our team. Um, we had, I think we had 61 guys a couple of years ago. That's great. Um, yeah, we had a, a kid named um, Dylan Dennis that plays at LMU. Merrick Baldo plays at LMU. Uh, Chase Mydroth at USD. Robbie Knowles, USD. And then we had um, Jared and Kyle Karos that play at UCLA right now. And then Christian Bodlovich, who plays at Arizona State. So this, I was used to talent. And PD was just a little different that he was more had the tools. He just popped talent. But um, it was pretty obvious. You see him hit and balls are leaving the yard pretty easily. So Okay. That's cool. But he was a great kid. And, and again, like I said, we've been – I've seen really good coaches not have nearly the talent that we have. And, you know, it's, suffice to say that if they did, anybody could coach the talent I have. <laughs> hey, it's all about managing egos, right? When you got the talent, that's, now you got to manage the egos. That, that is true. Yeah. There is something to that, yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, so finally, I wanted to ask you about your podcast. So now you're a, a podcast host, just like me. It's called Heading for yeah, Home man. Podcast. Yeah. So I want to give you a shout out and give your your chance, uh, give you a chance to kind of tell us about the show and what kind of sparked the idea for you to get into podcasting. Well, so first off, we got to get you on next. So we're we're having this conversation right now, so we're do this as well. But I think the biggest thing for me was, and my experience was with my ex teammates and, and a little bit with myself, I felt like it's been tough transitioning back into the real world. And I've seen guys really struggle. You know, some guys actually, you know, pass away, commit suicide because of it had go really into the drug side. Yeah. Um, and I felt like there needed to be some form of platform to at least process some of this stuff. And, you know, guys, we're not used to that. We don't want to process. We don't, we want to push our feelings aside as long as we can and yeah. not deal with it until it you know comes to a head and for some guys it's been you know the worst situation possible so i felt like this was an opportunity to have real conversations with ex ball players and how do we help out not just them throughout the you know the conversation but how do we help out others and how do we provide an environment and a platform for those that are really in need somewhere to go somebody to talk to or somebody to listen to at least to say okay i'm not in this alone this is this is something that we're all going through and maybe that pushes that guy to talk to somebody or, or, or do something. And, and, you know, we're, we're in the very initial stages of starting some things to, that would provide resources to guys like that. Um, I just think it's, I mean, look, it's, we, we play games at 7 PM. We go to sleep you know, we finish the game at 10. We have dinner at 11. We're, you know, we're back at the place at 1130 and you're wired from the game. Yeah. And so you go to bed at two 30 and then you wake up at noon and, what other job does that? And, and the other thing too, is you have all this adulation throughout the whole minor leagues and, and college baseball about how great you are. And then as soon as it's done, you're not, in, you're not important anymore. You're back in the real world with, with transferable skills, that, but, but you don't realize you have transferable skills. Right. You just think you're an ex ball player and people should, should worship you or you're super bummed that it's over because that's yeah. all you knew. And so it was, you know, the, the goal is to, to provide those guys with somewhere to go, you know? Yeah. I think it's great. And I, uh, what I've found a lot of is uh, people like to tell their story from like, versus the media telling it, you know, obviously if they're big enough, but let guys want to tell their story of how their career went, you know, yeah. what they actually went through. So it's a good platform for, for us to do that. And also people don't understand the uh, part of my angle is like the minor leagues is such a mystery. 
Like you're living with guys that you're competing against also, you know, like you don't want that. Like you want to be the one to get moved up, not them, but yeah. you're like, you got to be a good teammate. And it's a, a weird dynamic. Dude. Right. Yeah. And, and again, you, that's a great point. You hit it on the head. It's like they're in their organizations that really push that you're competing against others. I think the reason the Indians really stood out for me was I didn't feel that as much there, but other organizations and I played with five. It's like, you definitely felt that and you're supposed to spend six months with that person and enjoy them and, and root for them. And then, you know, your life's on the line, so to speak. And yeah, yeah, man. I mean, it's, that stuff's real. And so it's tough. Yeah, for sure. And last thing, just because, you know, your show is, is pretty, it's very chill. You're in a, you're in a cool van by the beach. Like you got coffee in the morning or you got beers, whatever. <laughs> that's, like, that's where we're at right now. There you dude. go. If you're watching on YouTube, the guy's freaking on the beach. Like what a, what a life. Um, Where'd the idea to come to come up for you to do to record inside the van right near the water? Um, so my producer Zach Parker, who we both know, yeah, fantastic guy, one of my favorite people in the world. Yeah. Um, just just notice that there's an you know, this is actually what I do, like for better or for worse. I'm a big surfer and uh, you know, bought this van seven, eight years ago, and it's kind of been a little bit of a sanctuary. I'll drive it down, I'll read, I'll go get some sushi, I'll go surf, I'll come back. I'll, you know, do a few things. And there, there's just this like element of, of, um, tranquil whenever I'm in it. And so he's like, dude, the van, like, what about the van? And so it almost has become like a character in the podcast it's, for sure. You know, it's, it's, it's part of the story. So, um, you know, and the nice thing is you can, it's, you can take it anywhere. You can camp and you open up the, open up the rear trunk and you're like, boom, you're, you're wherever you are. So no, it's, it's special. And, I love this thing. It's, it's pretty, no, it's pretty awesome. Fun. Yeah, it's great. No, I enjoy watching it too. It's fun. It's just, it's easy. It's easy listening. So it's great. Yeah. And, uh, obviously you've been through a lot in your career. So you have the perspective that people would want to hear too. So yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's been good. You had a great career too, man. I was looking at it. Gosh. <laughs> I did all right. And you had some, dude, had some good numbers in AAA too. Yeah. Not just, and ne never not got the call. Yeah. I know. You know. One big league. Well, that's fan. what's so yeah. crazy about this thing is like, you know, you can do everything you're supposed to do and, and it's in somebody else's hand. Like, you know, Brett, go, go pitch well for two months in AAA. Great. Yeah. I just did. Okay. Is it my turn? No, it's not your turn. Like, yeah. How does that work? So yeah. that's, I mean, that's another beautiful professional baseball thing. Exactly. And I do tell people, I'll say this is once you leave your original organization, it's hard for that new organization to push you through. Like they already have the guys they drafted. They didn't draft you. You're not a yeah. priority. You know, so it's hard to make it through once you leave your original team. Yeah. Yeah. And, th and that was, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because, yeah, when the, with the Rockies thing initially, it was like, yeah, here's my shot. And, you know, looking back, probably would have been better to stay with the Indians. But yeah, you know. exactly. I want to just give you an opportunity to, to tell everybody where they can follow you and listen to your show and, and find all the uh, interesting stuff that you're doing. Yeah. Um, so we're at, um, at Heading for Home podcast on Instagram. Uh, we're working on a website right now, finishing up, um, should be on, the, on, uh, any kind of internet browser heading from podcast.com. And, uh, my email address is heading from podcast at gmail.com. Literally you guys have any questions or anything, but seriously, Brett, you're doing a good job, man. I appreciate this. This is really cool. And this is great. I really Can't... enjoy your show as well. Thank you, man. Can't wait to be on yours and I'm sure we'll schedule it right after this. So, uh, yeah, no, yeah, I appreciate sure. it, man. It was great having you on. Thank you. My thanks to Keith Ramsey. Hope you guys really enjoyed that episode. Uh, we both had similar career paths. We've been through a lot in our, our baseball and professional careers. So um, I really enjoyed talking to him. He's a great guy, easy to talk to. So uh, heading for home podcast, make sure you guys go check him out on social media and uh, on his website. That's soon to, to be coming out uh, in the coming days. It's heading for home uh, And that's Keith Ramsey. So my thanks to him. And uh, I'll be on his show pretty soon. So I'll drop those uh, those episodes when they are ready as well. Uh, if you'd like to follow us on social media, it's at Two Tall Sports Podcast. That's on Instagram. On Twitter, it's at Two Tall Sports. Uh, you can also email the show, Two Tall Sports Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, if you'd like to follow us on YouTube, please subscribe there. We need all the subscribers we can get. Share it with a friend. That'd be great if you really enjoy the content. 
uh, that'd be awesome. And drop some comments, like the videos and, uh, and share them with your friends and family. Uh, hit the bell notification when you subscribe so then you're notified every time we drop an episode, which is usually Thursday mornings. And we try to be consistent with that. Uh, please follow along on Apple Podcast and Spotify. So that's on the audio side. We're on Pandora Music. We're on Apple. We're on Spotify. We're on Amazon Music. And we're on Google Podcasts. Pretty much everywhere you can find us. Um, if you're on Apple, we'd really appreciate it. If you'd scroll all the way down, hit the five-star rating on the episode page. If you think we're five-star worthy, that'd be awesome. And uh, if you have an extra second, you can leave a review there as well. It helps boost the show. So. Uh, we appreciate you guys listening. Thanks for coming on as, as always to listen to our content and uh, have a great week. We'll talk to you next week for, with another great episode. Thanks. <laughs>